Oh, hi there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinga. And this is episode number 160170. What's going on? Six, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uno says zero. What's going on? How you doing? Hola todos. It's me. It's your boy coming from coming at you live and direct from Stratford. Get my words out there in one go. Feeling good. Feeling fine. Got the coffee in hand. Here we go, podcast friends. Ooh. Um. But before we get started and we get all happy and excited, unfortunately, um, some uh breaking news breaking 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 news has um spread across the interwebs and unfortunately um one of my um favorite people in fashion and somebody who i kind of looked up to and who i gained a lot of inspiration and motivation from and um somebody who kind of really personified what it meant to be uh a eccentric to the fullest uh point of view he was somebody that was unbridled in his talent unbridled in his um creative ability um came, he was probably the best giver of interviews ever that exist in the creative field and generally an all-around legend um carl lagerfeld unfortunately has passed today at the age of 85 um he is the he what well, he was at the helm at chanel and Fendi and a few other projects that he had underneath his belt. He was the true um, antithesis of a Renaissance man, a polyglot, whatever you may call multidisciplinary geniuses. And just in general, just somebody who I immensely looked up to just in terms of being a creative powerhouse. Again, I think I mentioned a few times on this podcast that my introduction to fashion was quite weird. I didn't come into fashion um, following avant-garde designers um, like uh, Comme des Garçons, um, like Ray Capcuma or Comme Garçon or Maison Margiela when that was going on at the time or Helmut Lang. I didn't get into fashion that way or even with Raph Simmons. I came into fashion uh, through the super commercial end of the uh, end of the totem pole because I ended up tapping into fashion from reading the Sunday Times magazine. And they had a style magazine on the inside of the Sunday Times edition. And that's like, my first introduction to what fashion meant. And the reason why I liked it was because that then gave me the pathway to start reading British Vogue and then US Vogue and stuff. And I liked the balance between, um, you know, artistic expression and commerciality, right? I like that balance that these big designers, such as, you know, Tom Ford and he was like Gucci, somebody I followed that for a long time. Somebody who was able to um, express what they wanted to express creatively, right? Um, you know, give them, um, imbue little nods that would um, only be recognized by fashionistas or people that are obsessed with fashion, or people that are obsessed with art, but then also be able to appeal to the, you know, to the mum in the middle of America or to the, you know, to the older gentleman that lives in the middle of Paris or somewhere, right? Somebody that doesn't necessarily know what the codes are, doesn't necessarily know where the lineage comes from, doesn't necessarily know the inspiration, but they just love the garment in itself. And I think that's one of the rare talents that Karl Lagerfeld was able to imbue. And of course, um, it seemed like the older he got, the more workload he took on, right? The resort collections, um, the collaborations with high street and brands such as um, H&M. He was the first person to do that, which nowadays is like a rite of passage for a designer because, you know, I do remember even, do you remember when Comme de Garçons did the collaboration with H&M, how, how much stick they received, especially on forums that I used to read back in the day, like um, the fashion spot, which I think is still around now, but I used to go on the fashion spot quite a lot back in the day. And I remember um, Ray Kyle Kubo was getting ripped apart from pillar to post because, you know, she was somebody who was adv um, firmly against um, fast fashion at the time right she kind of uh, adopted the quite a few strong stances when it came to wastage and fashion and a lot of political opinions that kind of went against her decision to kind of you know get in bed with H&M and do a collaboration with them but of course the the kind of long-term goal of that collaboration was to you know in general like get the public aware of what Comme de Garçons were doing so that when Dover Street Market took off and started becoming this multi-label platform that loads of brands could come then and and go on top of customers will be familiar with the brand so the idea of kind of marketing your brand by doing these high street collaborations is something that was new but Carl Lagerford knew that was something that he needed to tap into and essentially he turned himself into he kind of re, he kind of was able to reinvent himself off the back of that collaboration and reintroduced himself to like a whole different group of people who never knew anything about him so much so that in his later years he did a the recent club recent documentary actually that's on netflix i recommend you check it out it's called seven days out and it follows a, a bunch of people a bunch of kind of 
individuals from their varying, varying fields, such as chefs and whatever they may be. And they are building up to present something, whether it's a dinner, whether it's a fashion show. And it kind of um, goes through the entire process of the build up towards the final event. And it's very eye opening. And again, it's something that only came about during it's only it's something that's only been shown now during his later years. So it seemed that the older he got, the more projects he took on, the more things he was doing. And then through those projects he was doing, he was he was um, getting himself a new audience. He was exposing himself to new people who were, who were just fascinated with this older gentleman who was able to work so tirelessly all around the world um, on various different projects with various different people and various different demands, but still remain quite free. That was a weird thing. Like it never seemed like, even though some of the you know later designs were not necessarily people's favorites and people had a lot of things to say about whether or not they liked them or not, you can never argue that he was doing anything for just the sake of doing it. Um, everything seemed like he was doing it for a purpose. There was an idea behind it. Um, and there was a freedom about it. Um, he, he seemed creatively free. I'm not sure what's happened behind the scenes, but it didn't seem like he was um, beholden to the sales figures that were going on in his house. He kind of just did what he did and hope people kind of resonated with it. And for the large part, they did. You think about the fashion shows he did, the uh, you know the spectacles that happened, through, especially towards the end of end of his time at Chanel. The fact that some of his fashion shows will cost more, more would you know his one fashion show will cost more than you know the whole operation of one fashion brand on the up and up. Um, just in general, just a completely a complete freak of nature, and somebody in in you know in all with all respect being said. And some of my favorite quotes from Karl Lagerfeld I just pulled out here that I want to read out to you. One is. There is no secret in life. Um, the only secret is work. Get your act together and also perhaps have a decent life. Don't drink, don't smoke, don't take drugs. All that helps. Because again, I think there was, a, it, there was a time where, and this comes in the face of, this really kind of rankles against what a lot of these kind of, you know, newer designers are kind of complaining about. Because, you know, there are some, there are some um, valid complaints when it comes to the beast that is the fashion industry, the demands it puts on young designers, um, the needs that they have to meet, um, the fact that some of these designers are coming into it really young, like somebody I profiled the other day, uh, Grace Wells Bonner, is only 28 years old, right? Um, somebody like her being kind of thrust into the limelight and being told to take over this big house and all the demands that come with it. It's a lot to ask, right? But there, are, there is also, and I, there is also and part of me that kind of thinks that from most of these guys that came before these young designers have had to put up with as much pressure, if not more. And fair enough now we have the added, you know, the added mental pressure of social media and that malarkey, but the actual business sort of fashion has always been cutthroat, has always been uh, do or die, has always been sink or swim. It's always been like that, but there's been a very few amongst that group of designers who have been able to kind of ride the wave and, if anything, who kind of really... um who kind of live for the pressure, live for the moment, live for live for doing it. Because at the end of the day, you know, like as I'm, I'm just a fashion enthusiast. I'm not a designer myself, but um, I know I can just imagine how lucky you'd feel to have a job that you necessarily would do for free, right? We will, we've all been sitting in our rooms, cutting up magazines and dreaming about, you know, making the collection or dreaming about attending a show or dreaming about interviewing a designer that we loved, right? There's all these kind of fantastical ideas that you have in your head. And then to suddenly kind of break through the third wall, to suddenly kind of creep into that gated institution and make a career for yourself, um, it's something that you're mentally going to be grateful for. So there is a part of me that also thinks that sometimes a few of these kids that come into fashion and start complaining about the schedule, about the workload, they need to sometimes do, they seem to, I think they need to reflect on just how, um, fortunate they are to have a career let alone an industry that they love but in an industry such as fashion that's just you know you're eternally dreaming you're as designers or people that work in the industry you're you are forever living in a kind of never never land right you never really grow up you're always living in this fantastic in this fantasy world that doesn't really exist within the real world um every few weeks or so you get to tap out and you know be amongst your peers at fashion week with all that energy around and i went to fashion week for the first time when i went to when i went to paris to go see Virgil's off-white show, the first menswear show. And I was a little bit of a... I used to kind of have my nose up in the air about fashion shows. Oh, what's the point? doesn't matter. You see the images online. But just being around the fashion... Um, just being around the Parisian streets when fashion show was going around, the electric energy around the shows, before the shows, during the shows, after the shows, outside, during the after parties, you get a real understanding of just how magical and just how otherworldly that whole industry was. And Carl Lagerfeld was able to operate in that industry for 50-plus years um relatively at the top um 
um, steering a ship of a massive, massive fashion house in Coco Chanel, uh, taking you know with the ghost of Coco Chanel hovering over that brand, and he somehow was able to turn himself into this enigmatic figure that people were infatuated with, even more so than Coco Chanel. It's fucking inc- incredible. It's fucking crazy how he was able to do that over time. Yes, he had his controversies. Yes, he had these um, wild things that he said over the years. But like, much like Eric Weinstein has said a few times, who's part of the intellectual dark web, I think we need to kind of we need to. We need to be more willing to accept the eccentric the eccentricities of our, you know, the people that operate on the real edges of creativity. Ones, the ones that are really pushing things, the ones that are, you know, working ungodly amount of hours just for the love of it. We have to be able to be a little bit more understanding of the wild shit they may say, because by and large, they're not like me and you. Right, they are a bit crazy, and we reward them greatly for it. For for their craziness, is able to kind of you know make new silhouettes, new shapes, new f- um, introduce new fabrics, um, raise up a different type of sensibility. Like even what he said, I think remember once during, I think after the Chanel fashion show that they had for, I think the one that they did in the supermarket. Do you remember when he made like a fake supermarket? Um, and you could essentially, I think after the show, he allowed everyone could just take whatever they wanted from the shelves, like a Chanel branded fucking lemonade and shit like that, right? I remember he said after the show, something that really resonates, something that really kind of touched home and was something that I've kind of always thought about, especially when all these fashion insiders were kind of trying to poo-poo uh, streetwear, right? Was that um, he said something about luxury and he said something along the lines of like, oh, um, luxury is no fun if you're just treating like your Sunday best. Luxury is is an everyday way of life, right? Luxury is like what you wear to the supermarket. It's all about like that. That was his idea of luxury. So he's, I think he was saying something along the lines of like, um, we you can buy like a you can buy into Chanel like easily by buying a lipstick or a perfume. But in, in order for you to buy into that lipstick and perfume, I have to create this other world to make that lipstick and perfume covetable. So essentially, he's kind of tri- he tri- um, he treated his couture and his ready to wear collections as a as a as like a kind of dreamscape right as something that people can kind of um people can um what's that word called uh, can lust over right they can dream about one day affording like how many girls have you heard say one day they want to be able to afford a, a real chanel bag right um it's that idea of creating these um creating this collection that in you know stirs up that that feeling inside of you so that you'll then be more willing to buy a, a fucking 30 pound lipstick, right? Because you're going to feel like you're buying into the brand. And then the hope is over time, as you rise up the financial stakes or you get better jobs or you your situation changes in life, you can then start affording the other things. And then it, essentially, Chanel becomes a legacy brand, much like Coca-Cola uh, and all these other things just becomes a brand that you are always associate with luxury. But I just love the idea that he's, he said that luxury isn't your Sunday best. Luxury is wearing that shit every single day. And I love that. That's something I've always kind of adopted in, in terms of the clothes that I wear or the things that I buy and how I kind of wear them. I don't treat anything with any kind of specialness, um, right? I hate having shiny clothes, for instance, right? I purposely wash things a few times before I wear it so it gets the kind of like, you know, the brand new shop stain out of it um, or sheen out of it, per se. And Carl Lagerfeld did that in the highest level possible. Um, another quote here as well that I liked from Carl. He said, um, why should I stop working? Um, he mused to anyone who uh, dared breach the subject of his retirement. If I do, I'll die and I'll be finished. And I think that idea of working until you die was something that's only been accepted in the kind of current common, well, in the current conversation, I think of a few years ago, because I remember there was a time, especially, I think it might have been unbeknownst to him, it might be a consequence of Tim Ferriss's book, The 4-Hour Work Week, where everyone was trying to find a hack or a cheat code that would allow them to work as little as possible and then enjoy, I don't know, uh, I don't know, whiskeys on a beach or some shit, right? No one wanted to, no one wanted to work more than they had to. But then I think in the last few years, what's happened, I think, with the evidence of hustle culture, which has been something I've been a big fan of, I think out of the out of the out of the negatives of hustle culture that people don't like, I think the positive of hustle culture have also kind of sprung up. And the positive of hustle culture is that the person that's beating the drum of like work all day, work all night, sleep as sleep as little as you can and do the work, what they're actually saying is that I can do I can sleep for four hours a night and I can work all around the clock because I'm actually doing something that I love, something that I enjoy. So to me, it's not work, right? And that's something that's very foreign to uh, most people that have an everyday job, right? For the, for the most part, most of your friends or most of the people that I know, most of the people that I hang around with, for the most part, for, to, to take a take a title off of um, um, Gruber's book. I forgot his first name, but some surname Gruber. Uh, most of us have bullshit jobs, right? The jobs that we're working at don't necessarily, you know, if we didn't turn up tomorrow, the world wouldn't 
crumble, right? Our company wouldn't um, cease to exist. We do we do jobs that essentially um, are there just to kind of keep the train moving along, right? If you kind of leave, someone else will kind of slot back in and do your job easily over the period of two weeks in induction. Um, and for the most part, we're working in this place just to make sure we have clothes on our back, roofs over our head and, belly, and food in our bellies, which is all well and good. But I think the hustle culture guys and girls were really coming at odds. There was a big clash happening with the general public because we'd never, we could never in our heads, the general public, right? You can never in your head kind of rationalize how somebody could work a job that they actually loved. It didn't make sense to you, right? It's like, what the fuck? How does that make sense? Especially when it's a, especially when it's their own business, it's an entrepreneurship. Be like, oh, if I had my own business, I wouldn't let anyone, I wouldn't be working all day. I let someone run it and I'll be, you know, enjoying uh, cocktails on a beach, right? You, That's the idea that you have. But actually what happens is that from reading what these people say and someone like Carl Lagerfeld saying here, what happens is that eventually once you start working on something that you love, that working for something that you love is actually what's giving you a reason to get up at, get up in the morning. That's giving your life purpose. And all of us human beings, whether you are, whether denomination you may be, whether race, creed, um, socioeconomic level, whatever it may be, we all want to have a purpose. We want to feel belonging. We all want to feel like we matter, that we have something that we're doing, whether it's kind of looking after children, whether it's helping out people. We want to feel like we're doing something that gives us a reason to be awake, that gives us a reason to wake up in the morning. And sometimes finding your passion and being able to be, and getting paid for it is one way to do it. So then when someone like Carl Lagerfeld says, um, when someone like when someone like Carl Lagerfeld asks continually, when will you retire? To him, it's kind of, it, it seems like a bit of an affront of like, as soon as he hears retirement, he hears death. Because he can't imagine himself not working. The only time he can imagine himself not working is when he's dead. So um, essentially that kind of way of thinking was something that was definitely a mind-blowing thing for me at the time. Because again, like I said, I've always worked in jobs where I've always had in the back of my head that I don't really like where I am. And I'm just doing this for the time being to get to where I want to get to. Right. And um, But there was also a part of me that was also kind of a little bit... It used to rub me up the wrong way. The whole hustle, hard hustle until you don't go to don't go to sleep thing used to piss me off because again, I just think it's a certain kind of personality that can do that. I think it's a bit um, unwise to tell the majority of the world that they should work, you know, ungodly amount of hours because not everyone can do that. But then thinking about it over time, taking a step back and taking myself out of it, I realized that actually what's actually happening is that these people are working on things that they enjoy and they love. So in their head, they don't need that. Um, in their head working all day doesn't have the negative connotation that it has in my head which again is something that you have learned from carl and lastly a quote another quote here from carl which i really liked was this it says when people talk about the good old days i say to people it's not the days it's not that the days are it's not that the days are old it's you that's old i hate the good old days what is important is that today is good and i repeat that when people talk about the good old days, I say to people, it's not that the days are old, it's you that's old. I hate the good old days and what's important is to, is that the day is good. And I fucking love that quote. Um, I've, I fucking hate nostalgia. I am a big hater of nostalgia. Nostalgia is one of the things that I hate most and it's one of the things that always kind of gets drawn. Always, and it's kind of scum constant source of inspiration in fashion for the most part right everyone's always referencing stuff in archives and taking stuff and sometimes in fashion it can be done in a good way in a right way right where you can kind of you know take on themes and and certain topics that i'll talk about in in the in the archive or shapes or tones or whatever it may be but sometimes it's so copy and pasty the referencing in fashion it can really rub me up the wrong way and in general just in everyday society from flashback fridays to tv to, to throwback fridays to whatever everyone's trying to remember the good old days when they were a particular kind of person and for me i think there's no better time than to than right now right in this current moment that we're in and for someone like Carl Lagerfeld to say that, to adopt that kind of way of thinking is incredibly admirable because he could easily, if he wanted to, would probably with his eyes closed, design tens of thousands of collections referencing stuff that he's done in the past. Not even referencing stuff that other designers have done because that's, that's another thing that he also was very adamant to do was he kind of, you know, he made sure he um, limited his um, fashion exposure and kind of tried to ref um, re only reference things that were going on inside of his head right it's like it's similar to like sampling and hip-hop right he tried not to stop tried to make his own beats from scratch right and it shows in this work right sometimes it showed for the worst it kind of looks a little bit tired and a little bit repetitive but sometimes it showed for the best where he was able to kind of really you know um talk about things that no one was talking about at the time and make them you know uh pop and again i just think it's an admirable point of view to adopt and something that i think he purposely gave himself challenges and hurdles to overcome because essentially he was working you know at the house of chanel he had un 
um, he had an, an untapped well of resources that he could like plug into, but he always gave himself these little hurdles he had to jump over in order to kind of work really well in terms of even the sketching thing, which is another thing that I was a big fan of. He was actually an ardent sketcher. He sketched all the time, which is something that's been lost nowadays in fashion. There's loads of designers that always come. There's loads of, there's, you know, there's hundreds, there's thousands of designers that come out and say they don't sketch and they just do everything on the body. You know, it's kind of, as a kind of reaction against the, um, um, what you call traditional fashion practices. But in general, i just think he was an absolute powerhouse um somebody that will be greatly missed i think in the entirety of fashion and again i just don't think we're going to see another guy like him ever again i don't think we're going to be able to see somebody who's going to be able to steer such a ship um <laughs> and appeal to the you know the geeky fashionistas like myself and your average everyday woman on the street and um, i don't think we'll ever see that ever again but yeah r.i.p um carl lagerford an absolute legend and if you haven't already um check out try and watch as many interviews as you can of his on youtube he's probably one of the best people to listen to when it comes to perspective on life and stuff he's just an amazing dude and again um he will be greatly greatly missed um anyways let's roll on to some topics because that's the fun thing here da, 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 da. okay so talking about fashion there's some great fashion career advice here from one Derek Blasberg right now I'll, I'll confess to you I, I wasn't necessarily that familiar with well I, I knew who Derek Blasberg was you know you see him on the fashion circuit all the time he's always hanging around with the you know with the models and the socialites and stuff like that 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 you know and love in the fashion industry but I kind of dev, nev, never knew what he actually did right and if anything if I'm being completely honest, his face always kind of wound me up, right? I don't know why it is. He kind of just got, he's got a bit of an annoying face. I'm sure he knows of this. I'm sure he's aware his face is kind of annoying, but it is what it is, right? Everyone, everyone's got their things. I'm sure people might think I have an annoying voice, might have annoying hands, annoying nose. I don't know. There's things that everyone has that's annoying. Whatever. It, it is what it is. But he's got this great interview actually on Business of Fashion, which I make, recommend you check out. Business of Fashion are kind of pivoting and steering away from just being um, a platform to just report on industry news and they're kind of really trying to shape the conversations that happen in the fashion industry from talking about sustainability from talking about um data protection from the podcast things that they have to the panel discussions to the career platform to the educational resources they're really trying to um usher in a whole new generation of fashion professionals right and i guess for the, for the reason it might be based on the fact that Imran Ahmed was a bit of an outsider when he started business of fashion and he's probably come into this industry from the outside in being a fashion being a fan of course but not kind of coming from the agency design house world and working and so working way up interning here and there and he's kind of maybe seen that it's the same faces that exist in every kind of company right which kind of again is the reason why we see stuff like the Gucci blackface thing happen, right? Regardless of what your feelings are behind it, the reason why we see things like that happening is because it's the same people working in these companies for the most part, right? For decades and decades, there's no real emphasis to bring in fresh new faces. It's a bit, the, the, the employees of these companies or these agencies or these brands become their own gatekeepers, right? Because essentially, they know that these jobs are highly covetable, right? Everybody that reads Vogue magazine, reads ID, reads Days, reads all these magazines would want to have those jobs. And probably could do those jobs with their eyes closed. So in order to kind of protect these jobs that are probably not needed, right? They're probably overpaid. Um, they have to kind of um, enforce this kind of like gated community around them where no one really knows how to get in. Um, even to get an internship, you have to kind of beg and plead. The internships really don't sometimes nowadays because everyone's kind of aware of the industry don't really need to lead to nowhere. And a lot of people are kind of having to do things their own way, DIY way, whether it's starting their own agency, whether it's starting their own creative agency, whether it's starting their own model agency, starting their own magazine, starting their own um, publishing platform in order to kind of circumvent um, the industry and kind of like wriggle in that way, which can some people can work, but some people, you know, they don't want to start their own zine, right? Some people just want to have a job and it's hard to get in. But I love the interviews they've been having lately where they've been interviewing some individuals within the fashion industry and trying to get an understanding of actually what goes into, what went into kind of um, them making it and Derek Blackburn's Derek, Derek Blasberg's interview is really good like again I didn't know much about him I thought his face was annoying but I, now I'm a big fan of him I like the guy and I think the reason why I like the guy is because reading his story he's not from the major cities right he's from Missouri 
he came from the outside in. So he was fascinated with fashion just as just as I was, right? Sitting in my house in um or in my mum's house in Cannon Town, custom house, um, with no real connection to anything to, to do with fashion, just being a guy reading the Sunday Time magazine, finding this magazine inside the style mag and be like, Oh wow, it's amazing. And then that kind of cascading into reading ID, reading this, da 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 and then which eventually leads me to St. Martin's and then blah 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 blah. And then now I'm I'm kind of hearing this weird kind of, you know, creative marketing blah, blah blah space right that's where i kind of got from but my passion came from the fact that i was on the outside looking in i was kind of infatuated with this world but i was also comfortable being on the outside and, and loving it from there but i think that fact that Derek blasper came from the outside in is why this interview is really detailed and really gives some real practical advice for those of you out there that want to get involved in the industry and i really recommend you check it out because he really details his um journey um well and from detailing his journey you can really tell why you can tell why he got where he got to and why you know essentially you see him with all these models and all these fashion industry people who generally seem like they like his company um one bit that sticks out I, i've read a couple of bits that sticks out here for me in the interview it says the following so this is on the business of fashion it's called um Derek blackburn's tips on for getting it ahead in fashion i'll link it in the show notes if you want to check it out but it says the following um, the interview asked him, at the beginning of your career, how did you start networking? And immediately something that well, I liked essentially what he said is this. I never liked the word network, which is great, right? Because if you look at Derek Blasberg on, online, if you Google image search him and you see who he hangs around with, you would think that he's the quintessential networker, right? The quintessential let's grab brunch, the quintessential let's chop it up, right? Let's connect. You think he is that cringy guy, but actually it's not like that. And it, and it continues. It makes it sound like... Or it, all the relationships I have in fashion world are, pro are, are professionally strategic, which is kind of offensive. And I heard, totally agree with him. When I went to LA to see um, the Golf Wine Festival a couple of years ago, it was my first time going to LA on my own. It was fucking amazing. Great experience. I loved everything about it. But one thing that was quite grating and kind of made me feel a bit yucky was that whatever, whatever party I went to, you know, I'm a, I'm, I'm a pretty outgoing kind of person. So I guess wherever pie I went to, people got the impression that because I was the way I am in general, day to day, that I was somebody of importance. And they'd come up to me and start talking to me and trying to be my friend. And I just thought people were being friendly. But in the moment, I kind of just told them, you know, what do you do? Oh, I work a regular customer. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm a, at that time, I was a marketing assistant. I'm just a marketing assistant. They had they just like completely ditched me, right? Because I just had a regular nine to five. I wasn't, I wasn't anyone. I didn't have a show. I wasn't writing a pilot. Uh, my dad didn't own the network. I was just a regular dude, right? So they kind of would just, you know, turn tail and go somewhere else. And it kind of made me feel disgusted. I was like, Jesus Christ, these people are only talking to me because they think I have something, they have something to gain from our relationship, right? It's not something that's like a, not actually want to be my friend. They actually want to hang out. They just want to see what kind of value they can suck out of me. And Derek Blasberg, again, says it here, right? The idea of having a network of friends is offensive because it means as if like they are your, you are all working together to kind of get your career forward. Now, there is, it does happen sometimes, right? There is, especially in streetwear, you've probably, and we can all mention the people that we see on streetwear where we can tell from the outside looking in that these friendships aren't real. They're not, they know, they're quite surface level. And the moment someone gets involved in any sort of controversy, you know, these friends that are talking about, you know, spreading, oh, I'm so proud of this person, so proud of that person. The moment they get into any kind of controversy, they are completely silent and don't make any comment on social media, which again is kind of striking because it shows that, you know, the relationships are only about how they're going to get themselves forward but there also is this there also is a, an opportunity within that kind of disgusting kind of like oh let, let me just use you to kind of get where i want to get to there is also a space for you to kind of actually cultivate actual real relationships which will go a long way to getting you where you want to get to just just with pure karma not anything else just with pure like being a good person there is something about being different than anyone else in the group and actually wanting to talk to that person because you want to hang out with them right actually going about things differently whether it's like you have a famous friend and you never take pictures together with them um, you have somebody that's of influence you never ask a favor from them to get you something that you want there is a way to kind of cultivate actual friendships that are probably going to serve you not serve you but they're probably going to be more beneficial to you and your life in general than it is to kind of always try and extract, extract value and again i just think nowadays it's hard because you know kids want instant gratification you want to get on straight away you see stuff on social media and because you see the final project you, the final image you think that's it like they just made it then they uploaded it and it happened when you don't and when you have no idea what the backstory was behind it like again me i had my own personal um impression of what Derek Blasberg was but across this um by reading this interview again he might be presenting one face i don't know how he is in real life and i've met him but 
just from reading the interview, my, my impression of him has completely changed. And I've now seen, oh, there's a reason why he's always hanging around in models. There's a reason why he's always hanging around industry inside. There's a reason why. There's a reason because he's actually a cool dude and he's actually got a really long storied history of coming up in the industry, working a million jobs. Anyway, but the interview continues. Um, do, 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 which is kind of offensive. I, I've carved out a family for myself in this business and I'm proud of it, which is, again, I'm really, uh, I think that's something you could stick a pin on because, again, you know, coming from the outside of fashion and trying to be involved in it or for me trying to be involved in streetwear, trying to be involved in in everything that goes into it, whether it's sneakers, whether it's, you know, whatever it may be, there is something quite amazing about finding people, especially the older you get, right? Finding people that you... Sh- finding new friends which is hard it's hard to do the older you get anyway in general right it's difficult to find new friends but then finding new friends that also share your interest right that into the same thing you're into which is a very very niche interest right being involved being interested in fashion and caring about these kind of things caring about art caring about music going to gigs right um all these kind of things going to festivals all over the world it's something that not everyone does right it's something that's only reserved for a small group of people to find that group of people and tap into them right and become actual friends with these people that where you have someone to go out with we have someone to hang out with someone to talk about the new release to is something that you shouldn't take for granted so you know the, the ability to make a family within that little niche group that little niche subculture is something that you should hold dear but you should never refer to it as a network never refer to it as a network of friends that you're going to use or exploit for your own career gain because that isn't friendship that isn't friendship. Anyway, it continues. Um, maybe that sh- um, should be the first tip for n- working in fashion. If you don't have a passion for it, don't bother, which I, I, I really understand. And he says, to be honest, I didn't know this industry existed until I moved to New York to go to college. I grew up in St. Louis, St. S- St. Louis M- Missouri, where high fashion was the Gap Store um, and the mall, uh, at the mall. And before YouTube hosted millions of hours of style programming for any serial secret fashion lover to see whatever in the world. So when I got to New York, I discovered this glamorous creative world and I was like, this is it, sold, right? So he came into it with that understanding. Uh, the way it all started for me was um, I was with a girl who lived below me in a freshman dorm. My, my, very first, uh, f- my very first friend in a big city who was a part-time student and a part-time model with Elite. Now this explains everything, why Derek Blackford is always hanging around models, right? So he's, his first friend in New York was a model and then he got introduced to all the other models and he says, um, she introduced me to her agents who then became my friends too. Again, friendship. Um, they commissioned me to write biographies, which again, I'm sure he wasn't paid to do something he's offered to do for free, which again is another note to you guys watching out that you want to make an industry for the girls. It's probably boring work too. Um, that's where I first met Giselle, Karen Ellison, and Amber Violetta. Uh, Violetta, sorry. In my sophomore year, I wrote a press release for a fashion PR company. I then entered at W Magazine in my junior year and American Vogue in my senior year. After I graduated in New York after University of 2004 with two degrees in journalism and dramatic literature. Again, actual, an actual education, right? Which is fucking awesome. I got a job as an assistant at um, Vogue. I turned out to be a terrible assistant and I was fired from that job a year later. But that's a whole other story. But again... The idea of going into an industry, um, understanding how lucky you are to be in and actually trying to form real relationships. Look how far that gets you. Um, did you feel the, con- the the golden rule of as had to? Did you did you follow a golden rule as had to connect yourself? Right when his intern, he said yes. When I was an intern, I overheard a Vogue editor explain the reason she always booked a certain model was because she was, um, and this is a direct quote: "Happy to be here, easy to work with." This clicked with me. And that's something that doesn't get said often more enough, right? I think I've mentioned it a few times, but Neil Gaiman has this amazing quote um, in his commencement speech where he kind of speaks about the three things that you need in order to kind of, you know, get ahead in life, right? So I think being on time, good someone to be, uh, being uh, being on time, uh, being a pleasure to be with, and then um, handing in your work on, t- being on time, and, and doing high quality work, right? High quality work, pleasure to be with, um, and being a, whatever, those three things there's three things anyway there's, there's two of the three that you need to have in order to get forward in life but essentially one of the things i always drew that I always kind of drew from that new game unquote was the idea of some of being great to be around because sometimes i think in those, most industries because i've you know i've kind of skirted around different kind of sub industries whether it's kind of nightlife world the sneaker world the streetwear world the fashion world the startup world and i've seen that in most of those industries for the most part most of the people that have been there a long time are quite cynical, right? They're quite cynical. They're quite dour. They've kind of been beaten up by the industry, whether it's been good or bad, right? They've kind of seen all of... They've, they've seen the good and seen the bad, but probably more bad over the last few years, right? They've been there, done that, got the T-shirt. And for them, the magic has gone, right? The magic is fucking... It's evaporated. It's, 
disappeared, right? It's just a business, just something that keeps the lights on. It's obviously they're passionate about it, but it doesn't have that same allure that it did for you, right? But I think there is something to be said for coming into that industry new and fresh face and trying to remain optimistic, trying to remain grateful, trying to remain um, just happy to be there, right? And actually letting that kind of um, exude from your body, actually letting that be a vibe that everyone could just read about, wow, this kid is just like, you know, going out to get everyone meal deals at Tesco, right? But they're so happy just to be around a photography studio because it's something that you've dreamed about forever. And I think that attitude goes a long way, even if you're not good at what you do, right? That attitude goes a long way because by and large, a whole room full of cynical people are only cynical because it just fits the room. The moment you're the one happy, jolly person in there that's saying good morning, that's asking people how their weekends were, that's inquiring about people's boyfriend and girlfriends, that's asking what someone did for their birthday, you become just a, you become somebody that everyone can kind of like um, escape to when they want to just like, you know, have brighten up their day a little bit. And that's something that I've kind of always kind of uh, held close to my heart and has held in my head as something that whenever I start new roles or new jobs, especially when it's something that's quite difficult to do in the first or in the beginning, is I try and say, okay, I'm going to start this job and I'm probably going to be shit for the first couple of weeks or so, right? I'm probably not going to do the work on time, but what I want to do is I want to be good to hang around. I want to be a good team member. I want them to know that I fit in with them. I don't want to fit in with them by forgetting who I am. I want to be exactly who I am, but I also want to let them to know that me being who I am is a great accompaniment to the to the company to the team overall and i've been doing that forever and i think for the most part in most of my jobs maybe bar maybe for the exception maybe except maybe two um where it hasn't really worked out personalities personalities haven't really clicked for the most part i've been in most places i've been in even if even if people might say oh he was too loud oh he didn't do his work blah blah, blah. one thing that no one can ever say was that I wasn't fun to be around, right? And that's something, again, that I think, especially in the fashion world where people are ultra cynical, right? Ultra dull. You only have to watch a couple of panel discussions on So Studio, right, with a popular designer to see how uh, cynical and snarky people are when it comes to that industry. Again, it's, you know, they've been ground down by it. But I think if you come into it with a bit of a positive attitude, I think, honestly, you could go a real, real long way. Um, anyway, it continues. Um, it says, oh, um, uh, did I love waking up at 7 a.m. on a Saturday to unpack bunches of trunks um, that had come back from a shoot? Well, no, but I did it and I did it with a smile on my face and the people I was working with were into, into that. Also, truth be told, coming from Missouri and suddenly being knee high in couture dresses and diamond earrings wasn't that hard to smile at. If I had to add one thing to that golden rule, it would be never say no. Can you make copies? This is when people still made copies. Uh, can you get coffee? Can you come in early tomorrow before you go to class? Do you want to come with us to the market appointment? We're, we're going for drinks later. If you want to join. Yes, 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 yes. And that's something, again, that is difficult nowadays. I've got to be honest for me because of the whole, you know, when you grow up, you don't necessarily want to be out too much. And you know, I've got the DJing stuff I do on the side and everything else I'm doing on the side through the podcast, whatever it may be, right? Um, my time is limited, especially if you consider that you're working five days a week and it's eight days in the out in the day to work, and then you've got all the other time outside of it only to do what you need to do. My time is limited. Even if I do wake up at five in the morning, I don't have much time to do the things I want to do. So I get quite protective with my time, right? I want to just I want to make sure I'm in control of what I'm doing. I don't want to be pulled in different directions. But there is something about these kind of industries, like um, the entertainment, creative industries, creative entertainment industries, where there is a responsibility or there is something that you need to understand that. The social gatherings, um, whether it be the drinks, whether it be the company things, whether it be the after after shoot things, are probably the, the most important thing that you need to attend or that you need to be at or that you need to be a good accompaniment with to um, good company at um, is the drinks. You just have to get those right. You have to get, especially in the first couple of months, it's something that you just have to ace. If you don't ace those things, unfortunately, I don't see how you're going to get forward. It's un it's unfortunate for people that don't drink, for people that don't want to involve themselves in that lifestyle. But I think there's something about just being there, right, and being good company and hanging out and having a good time that it really does go a long way in order to kind of that, um, set the path of your course where you want to go into in the future. Now, that's only if you want to be involved in the industry. If you want to just do your own thing and have your own brand, have your own agency, then just pull off from that and just do your own thing. It's going to take a long while, a longer time. It's a slower burn, right? Um, it requires a, you kind of investing money from your own pocket. It requires maybe more sleepless nights because it means you're going to be you're going to be doing you know you're going to be probably interning somewhere and then doing your own thing on the side. It's going to require a lot of work. But if you want to navigate the industry and you want to kind of um, um, hasten your journey to the top and kind of limit the time and shorten the time it takes you to get there, you really have to you really have to get great at attending these events, whether they be drinks, whether they may be going, and just being good company and just being knowing how to hang out. Um, 
da, 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 da. and one anecdote that you know i think is a story that we all kind of wish we kind of had the story that kind of gets you it's your kind of um cinderella shoe moment right this is Derek Blasberg's one. He says in the following, In 2004, the year Anna Winter launched the CFDA um, Vogue fashion fund, she asked Jonathan Becker to photograph the awards dinner. The photo editor couldn't find someone to hold Jonathan's lights for the portraits. And at the last minute, he was asked if I could quickly throw a suit on and do it. Could I? Happy to be here. Easy to work with. Jack, Mc, uh, Jack McCullough and Lazara Hernandez from Prones of Shola won that night. That uh, They brought uh, Packer Posey as their date. And after I finished holding those lights, all uh, we all went to the bar called Sway and celebrated. These two dudes are still my, my two best friends. So imagine from just being around and just being a cool guy that everyone knew to hang out and everyone knew was a good a good hang. He got recommended for this random job that would, you know, I, I guess photo assistants around the world that love fashion would probably, you know, cut off their left arm for. He got offered to do it. He could have easily turned it down because he doesn't know anything about cameras, but he said, fuck it, I'll do it. Put on the suit, did it. And all of a sudden, he gets introduced to his other quote-unquote network or circle of friends that then become his actual long-term friends, like some of the oldest friends in fashion. That goes to show just how just how important it is just to be a good guy, a good girl to hang around with, just to be good company. Away from all the interning, away from all the DMing people, away from being just a, you know, whatever the work is, away from that, just being a good person. Look how far it gets you. And this is in an industry where, by and large, everyone's quite cynical and quite snarky, right? Everyone's a bit dour. But just that idea that he came into it all bubbly from his kind of, you know, middle America attitude, just grateful to be there. Look how far it took him. Um, blah, 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 blah. Um, oh, and he goes here. How much effort do you put into building a relationship in fashion world? The answer is a lot. Um, I cannot sleep at night if I haven't gone through my inbox and replied, filed and deleted every single email I received that day. I look at Instagram twice a day, once I wake up and when I go to bed. I keep scrolling back until I get to this point where I looked at it the time before. If I say I'll be somewhere, I show up. Um, I never flake. I also have a perfect attendance from kindergarten through high school, so I'm used to never missing anything. Does this all require effort? Of course. But as my mum told me, when I was young, nothing good is easy and nothing easy is good fucking hell what great advice right what great advice awesome advice yeah again it's, it just goes to show that these people that you look at especially you see on social again because i had my impression of him beforehand i mentioned before um it's never by chance it's never ever by chance there's never a there's never a there's never a hack that they did there's never something that allowed them to that you know that, that there's no overnight success it doesn't exist even if it's overnight success to you to the person that it happened to it's not there was years of toil of like, you know, um, unaccredited work of things that no one knows about that you did in order to kind of get where you need to get to that now you finally got your break. People are then kind of saying, oh, you're only there because you're friends. You're only there because of this. But just to get those friends is difficult. So this story is fucking amazing. The idea that he goes through his messages and replies to everything. I'm sure there's people out there with less of a following that he, than Derek Blasberg has, with less of a, ne a, a group of friends than, than uh, Derek Blasberg does, who are quite bougie with their inboxes, right? Don't reply to certain things, leave people hanging, don't reply to comments, don't answer emails back again, which is maybe time consuming, but they don't even do that stuff. And he's doing it at his level that he's at, right? Um, and the idea that he got, um, it, if his word is his bond, right? He's got that, he's got that kind of old school, um, point of view about him where if he says he's going to be somewhere he's going to be there and i kind of you know I've, i i generally do have that too there are rare occasions where if i have to you know where if i don't feel like going somewhere i'll just say but i've never i've never been the kind of person that does that thing where i i stall and wait for a better plan and then i and then i decide whether or not what i'm going to go to if someone wants me to be somewhere and i can and i can be there i'll be if i'll be there if i can't i'll just say um and it's something i've kind of done throughout my time even at work if someone says oh there's drinks happening at work and i say yes even if I regret it later, I'm going to have to just, you know, suck it up and go. And then next time I'll know that not to do that again because I know how shitty I felt. <laughs> but I always try and say, I always try and keep to my word. And I think, again, these are little things that you don't get taught when you're in fashion school. You don't get taught when you're interning. You don't get taught these things. You think that actually the reason why you're there is because they want to, I don't know, they think you're really talented at holding lights or they think you can photocopy better than anyone or you make the best tea. No, actually... Part of the reason that's going to keep you there, or it's going to give you the opportunity, is the other things that go unsaid, right? Is how you are in meetings. Um, is the fact that you don't talk too much, right? The fact that you allow people in the room that are smarter than you, or who, or who have a higher position than you, to to have their platform to speak, right? You don't you don't butt in and think you have the most incredible idea. You let people say what they want to say. Um, you don't correct people. 
Um, you lend a hand. You anticipate people's needs before they even want them, right? You prepare pads of paper and notes and pens and that for meetings where people don't need them. You take notes when no one else should take them. Um, whatever it may be, there's little things that you do that are outside of just the work that are going to probably... Um, impact on your trajectory in fashion more so than you'd ever think and again these are things that don't get taught things that don't get said but i'm glad Derek Blasberg put it out there in the open i recommend you check it out i'm not going to read the entirety of the interview because it's a bit long but i recommend you check it out it's available on the business of fashion website um Derek Blasberg interview um titled uh tips for getting ahead in fashion i recommend you check it out it's really fucking good one of one of my favorites of the last season or the last, well, i've just seen recently anyway um Oh, Juicy Smollett update. Oh, my God. This story, man, just keeps rumbling on and on and on and on. More stories, more history, more details coming out. But essentially, Juicy Smollett, you know, the weirdest name you'd ever hear, right? Juicy or Juicy. Everyone's going to take the piss out of it. So it should be just Jesse, right? It's kind of transpired that effectively this kind of hate crime that he was going around on a press tour promoting is uh, an apparent hoax, it looks like, allegedly. It looks like he might have planned this with the with the two brothers that attacked him and you know it's a it's an unfortunate circ it's an unfortunate issue because you know i'm not familiar with jesse in general i didn't really know who he was prior to this whole issue but i only got exposed to him through his interview on the breakfast club right and he came across pretty cool right he came across like a cool dude he was talking about empire he's talking about the idea that he was being you know he's 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 an out gay actor he also happens to be black so the struggles that he's facing there in the industry and just in general just you know he came across as a really cool dude but for some reason, I don't know what happened in his life. I don't know what drove him to do the thing that he did. He decided it would be a good idea to plan this elaborate um, um, hate attack that would tap into the current zeitgeist of being a victim, right? Nowadays, being a victim is put on such a pedestal that we have all these dodgy characters that come out of the woodwork, like, you know, Asia Argento, you know, who was kind of the first kind of people that came around kind of pointing the finger at Harvey Weinstein and then her story kind of fell apart when kind of accusations got leveled at her. Um, and we've seen just this entire whirlwind of accusers and people getting accused of things that we can't necessarily pinpoint as being bad or anything. You know, as he's an sorry issue being one of them, um, a date gone wrong and suddenly he gets vilified and then you don't know whether or not it was as he's done sorry that was being a little bit too extra whether it was an unnamed girl just very crazy life where we live situation where at the point in time we're in at the moment, right? But the issue is, for me personally, is that for the most part, being a victim has become such a sport that you have these highly paid, highly privileged actors and actresses wanting to put themselves in the line of danger, wanting somebody to say some crazy shit to them or to be put in a crazy situation so that they can rally against something, right? Because for the most part, the average, you know, the average person on the street, the average man or woman, wherever your sexual pro uh, pro um, leanings may be, we generally go about our lives in the in the world without any kind of threat of violence. We generally go about our lives like not fearing for our lives in general, right? The world is a pretty safe place, especially if you live in Western Europe, right, or in the Western Hemisphere. It's not this. It's not what. It's not what these um you know um social justice warriors would like to to believe, right? Like you to believe that it's an actual. There's a civil war going on in the streets, right? That people are lynching uh people of color and you know uh chasing gays down the street and stuff and that's not what's happening at all there might be some places within the world that are a bit bigoted there might be places in the world that have their prejudices that have um prehistoric ideas of race and gender whatever it may be they they do exist as you know as there are good and good good and bad humans around the world but i think outside of those pockets of ignorance there are large swaths of the of the world where you can go about being exactly who you are unabashedly unashamedly and no one's going to give a flying fuck as long as it doesn't impact their life they don't care at all right we're super super accommodating super super willing to accept people for, for who they are and what they truly believe as long as they're good people we don't really care we don't really care the only issue people have with scientology nowadays is because they kidnap people right it's because they take um, mothers children wives and daughters away from their family they excommunicate people but for the most part if they if they did away if they weren't so militant and they weren't so cuckoo and weren't so crazy in terms of how they treat outsiders or people that question their faith people just can't leave them alone right it's a bit nutty the story right they're gonna go into this they're gonna go into these weird space pods and get shot into space and they're gonna meet their maker that way or whatever it may be the idea that it came from a prolific science fiction right in the first place is a bit shaky anyway but i think if they just kept themselves to that and they didn't do all the other crazy no one would care they'll just leave them to what they want to be so 
the, the idea that suddenly we've, we've reached a point where the narratives change and we all suddenly believe now that we're living in this fucking dangerous world where everyone's getting attacked on the streets is ridiculous. But unfortunately, um, people have understood what's happening in the, in the current zeitgeist. They kind of felt the temperature and now everyone's trying to be an activist, right? How many, I don't, I, I'd love to know. I don't know because I can't search. We can't do it. But I'd love, if there was a script you could run on Google, on, on Twitter, right? For the most part. Um, and you could kind of survey um, the amount of active users on Twitter and then survey the amount of active users that have activists in their bio, I bet it would be in the millions, tens of millions, right? Of people that have now proclaimed themselves as activists as if they're fighting against something that doesn't really exist, right? Um, I see people wearing t-shirts nowadays that have like the end racism, enjoy music. But for the most part in the music industry, I don't really see where racism it must exist. There might be prejudice. There might be some um, agendas that might be... Uh, spearheaded by some individual but for the most part we're all quite accepting but again like i said people have been able to tap into it for the benefit of their career it, it looks like justice smollett might have done the same thing and he's now he he fought somehow he had the ability i don't know what again it's it, would you call it arrogance or would you just call it pure stupidity how an actor thought he would um put to, he would kind of concoct a fake uh hate crime and make it convincing and compelling enough was crazy. The fact that he had a promo run set up for it, the fact that he was, you know, it came, um, it, there was no coincidence that it came like a couple of days before his show he was going to do a singing thing. It was a couple of days before, and then he, he announced he was going to do a, an interview with Good Morning America. And it's just a, it's just a, a, an incredibly crazy, crazy thing. More so because of him, of course, right? Because, you know, he fucked up. Um, I think this kind of reminds me of the Steve Renazizi story, a famous comedian who um, lied that he lied, um, I think on radio, I think first of all, that he was in the Twin Towers um, during 9-11, which then the whole story behind it is that he said he was in the Twin Towers during 9-11 and that whole incident made him be more appreciative of life because he, he got out of it alive and that's when he decided to move to LA and pursue his comedy career. But then over time, his story got picked apart more and more. And then New York Times investigated like good journalists do. And they found that, that he was actually a lie. But the good thing about Steve Renazizi is that when they kind of asked him the question, the standard comedian, why do you lie about this issue? It made, lo it made sense. Essentially, what happened is that he was in a situation where people knew that he was from New York. He was an unabashed New Yorker. And they asked him the question about the 9-11. And then the natural question, especially because at the time it was a fucking crazy event that kind of captured everyone's, Im not imagination, but it kind of, um, you know, it kind of spoke to everyone's worst nightmares, right? The fact that it would happen in a plane, the fact that the plane crashed into a building that was fucking world-renowned. It was just a horrible situation all in all, right? And then that's where the whole fear mongering of terrorists kind of spawned from. And the natural question to ask somebody that's from New York and, you know, when that thing just happens fresh is, oh, were you there? And he had, and I think you mentioned the interview, he had 15 seconds to decide what to say. And he decided to say yes. And then from the moment you say yes, um, you have another 15 seconds to kind of backtrack. But, oh, actually, no, 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 I wasn't there. But, I know, you know, it's kind of like, you know, to kind of fix the story. But he just kind of carried on. And then I think he mentioned that once he said it the first time, he felt quite dirty about it and he felt ashamed. But then he, he got mentioned in an interview. And then when he got mentioned in an interview, he had to say it again. It's another lie, right? Because you've lied already. You have to kind of continue it. And then from, from then on, it kind of wrangled on. But an interesting point that kind of really hit home to me wasn't what happened to him. Is the fact that he said that his wife then had to kind of carry on the lie. Because he lied. His wife then had to start lying too for him because naturally someone's going to ask the wife, oh, we heard Steve was in a building. How distraught were you about it? And then now she's having to lie. And I think that's something that we never really um, think about that I always think about when these public um, shaming things happen or people get caught out in public is how it must affect the family. Like Jesse Smollett's family, sisters, mothers, uh, fathers, uncles. This is That's the most embarrassing thing because it happens to somebody in your family, something quite high profile. It's like a supposed alleged hate crime. Then it transpires that it might be a hoax. <sighs> it's embarrassing for him, but it's also embarrassing for everyone involved in his family. Like, it's super embarrassing. And again, it's just like, we don't know why he did it, right? Oh, no. So we know why he did it because, you know, being a victim is, is put on a pedestal nowadays. It gets you attention. It gets you interviews on Good Man America. It gets you book deals. It gets you public engagement speaking um, gigs. It gets you loads of sympathy online, which people um, tend to kind of correlate with attention. Attention correlates to... Um, um, 
um, reach, reach correlates to revenue, revenue correlates to reaching your dreams, living in a penthouse somewhere. There's always a plan in motion. There's always something, but it's, it's, most of it has to do with monetary gain. There are stories out there that's supposed to be going to get thrown off empire. That's why he did it. Regardless of it, it's fucking crazy. It's fucking horrible. And if it comes out that that was true, I don't know how he's going to um, rescue himself from it. I guess the one thing that he could do is just put his hands up and say, hey, I'm sorry. I made a mistake. I fucked up. I was in, I, I was under pressure. I felt like no one was paying attention to my art and I wanted to get attention by any means necessary. Um, I looked at the 6 9 <laughs> I don't know, whatever, right? He could say, so, I there's something he can say. I don't, that's the only thing he could say. If he comes out and doubles down, it's a flop. If he comes, if he doesn't say anything and just disappears into the, into the shadows, it's a flop. But again, um, this really made me laugh. An article on TMZ, um, on TMZ, sorry, um, how they ran America and people made these parody <laughs> posters taking the piss out of him. There's got one here called the Black Prince, the Black Prankster with uh, Jesse Smollett's face on the cover of a Black Panther poster on a bus stop and there's one with his hat wearing uh, uh, Make America Great, uh, Make America Great Again hat um, under the the banner for the Black Klansman. Uh, this is my country with a quote on it. <laughs> so again, this is what I mean, like the internet never fails, right? Meme, the memes will keep rolling in um, once this story keeps progressing but again i feel sorry for the dude um i think now that it's been out i kind of i should have feel sorry for him because obviously it was it it it, it, it seems like he did it it was calculated right they rehearsed it it doesn't because it i think they it, would you be more sympathetic to him if like some two random black guys that he happens to know he didn't know they were their friends imagine if his friends did it as a prank or did it because they didn't want him to know that it was them and he covered their face up and said my country should throw him off and then he ran with it. That's one thing. But the fact that he, they rehearsed it, they were scouting out locations, this is nuts, man. And again, the fact that uh, a, an actor from Hollywood, right, thought he could outsmart the police is something that just never never really ceases to amaze me, right? When you watch these documentaries about criminals or people that do, you know, questionable stuff or, you know, criminal activity or do questionable things that might get arrested, the one thing that always just makes me laugh is the arrogance, right? It's the arrogance. The arrogance that they think that they can actually get away with this is just like shocking to me right there's police officers out there who sole profession their sole reasons for living right is to catch criminals just to kind of get people catch them red-handed um they dedicate their lives to it right they 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 do pull all nighters to catch criminals they rec- they are the masters of human psychology yet you you mr hollywood man think you can outsmart the police good luck <laughs> but yeah jesus christ what an amazing story man for all the wrong reasons again i hope it's a watershed moment I hope this is a point where we kind of do away with the whole like victim trophies right oh something happened to me um like you know and now all of a sudden you become a hero you become someone i don't know you someone heralded I, I guess horrible situations are horrible situations but the idea that victimhood and complaining about things has now become a sport or now become a part-time has now become a recreational activity is a bit yucky to me i think instead all that energy should be directed to kind of kind of correct the ills of what's happening it's not power imbalance it's not about you know getting more women involved getting more black people involved getting whatever involved it's not like a gender equality thing it's about changing the conversation and changing the mechanisms that allow these things to happen right essentially these things happen these um these abuses in power happen because people um want to keep these jobs that are very covetable right these jobs that don't go around that often whether it's a tv show whether it's a, like i remember someone someone mentioned actually about the louis ck thing like um what they didn't realize is that actually behind Louis C.K. was this entire industry, this entire machine that was chugging along, making these independent films that he was financing himself for the most part, or, you know, in partnership with other um, companies such as Lionsgate, wherever they may be. And that when he fell down or when his whole world crumbled, those jobs or those hires that he made that no one else was making, they also crumbled too, right? So much so that certain individuals that were working on these shows that were cancelled because of his, um, the thing that happened with, with Louis C.K., some of these people have had now to get have had to go get nine to fires, right? Because they were obviously, you know, they had in their mind that they were working on this project, they were gonna make an X amount of money, and all of a sudden your whole world crumbles. So there is something about that industry, right? Whether it's the entertainment industry that encourages people to be shitty, right? Encourage people to be not like to to do nutty things. We have to examine what is causing this delirium, right? In this industry where people want to be activists straight away, right? Want to get in front of the camera. Why? Because they're you know languishing in the pit of ir- irrelevancy no one gives a shit about them they can't make movies anymore because they're supposedly they're too old or supposedly they're too fat or whatever it may be whatever these kind of stupid um uh benchmarks you have to kind of meet when you're in hollywood so they kind of get um dashed to the side so then once this big social um issue comes along it's no surprise that they want to kind of put themselves in front of the camera and speak for everyone right and trying and trying to be this champion of activism right try and become like this glorified sjw and they're only doing that because their industry that they work in has 
chucked them away to the side and they think that that's the way to gain attention. Um, and again, I just don't think it's productive. I don't think anyone, by the, for the most part, especially the average person, wants to get lectured to, by a celebrity, right? Let alone somebody that's actually got a reason to be there, right? We don't want to hear from a celebrity that we should be trying to love each other and all this sort of stuff, right? Because by and large, in our everyday life, we do love each other. We might not love each other, love each other, but we tolerate each other. We go to work every single day without any argument, without getting to fisticuff, without stabbing somebody in the neck in a, on the fucking central line on the way to work because it steps on your foot a million times. We're quite good at getting along for the most part we can do it we don't need a celebrity to get on to, to get on the stage at the fucking grammys and give us a lecture we don't fucking care what they have to say for the most part but again it's because we've created this narrative that being a victim is suddenly something to be heralded in and i just don't think that should be the message being pointed out there the message should be how can we fix these broken systems there's stuff about it that does work but there's stuff about it that doesn't work let's fix that system so that we don't get these issues come up again but let's not become individual fucking social justice warriors for issues that for the most part you know, but again, um, I'm, I, I just feel sorry for just his, just his family and friends. I think those are the ones that are going to suffer the most. I think him, you know, he can deal with his own shame his way, but the family figure is the one, man. Oh, and all the guys that like, jumped out the window um, defending him, the Lee Daniels and stuff, making videos that... Like, <sighs> I just want to... I just gave him... You know, all those emotional videos people do on social media where they're trying to pretend, trying to hold back the tears. <sighs> How someone could put a camera in front of their face, right? A phone camera and try and pretend they're holding in tears and start recording it beyond me. When I'm crying, I'm crying. I'm not crying and being on my phone, right? Remembering to hold the fucking thing down and... <laughs> like, what the fuck is that, man? It's so bizarre. Actually bizarre. But hey, what do I know? Uh, moving on, moving on up. Um, also, get well soon to Majid Nazar, Na Nawaza. I always pronounce his name really badly, but he's like a an honorary member of the... Um, intellectual dark web from the uk somebody that you should be uk people should be familiar with he hosts a show on lbc um a former islamist extremist he might be calling him, whatever it may be he joined the caliphate and then he um uh, went to prison for a few years and then kind of was it reached a point of enlightenment where he saw the error in his ways and then since then he's been trying to convert various other extremists um, you know, through various talks, various books and various lectures and whatever it may be. And obviously his show on LBC, which is one of my favorites. And unfortunately, he was the victim of an actual real hate attack, right? An actual real one, not a fake one that Joseph Smollett was part of. And um, this is a story he shared on uh, Twitter here. Um, he says the following, um, Majis is the following. I just returned home from the hospital after having my wound glued up. I owe a huge debt to the two lovely young witnesses, both white, non-Muslim, male and female, who called the police and waited with me to console me and then provided witness statements. I won't identify them as I don't wish to endanger them. Your kindness kept me sane. I also thank Soho Theatre for identifying the racist assailant on their CCTV footage. I thank the police first responders for their professionalism, even though after the kind policeman asked my profession, he said, what's LBC? <laughs> I think Stephanie uh, Powell, who also white Muslim manager, non-white Muslim manager of the Hawksmoor Seven Dials, who was kind enough to rebandage my head personally in her restaurant after it became apparent that my wound was still bleeding. I thank our doctors and, and nurses who treated me um, with diligence and care. Uh, some of the far left are already politicizing this attack on social media by making it about my centrist views, somehow legitimizing right wing hate. Some on the right are callously uh, casting doubt on the fact that this att racist attack even happened, apparently referencing the American uh, actor called Judy Smollett. Some Muslims are um, openly celebrating the attack, wishing the racists had finished the job. Jesus Christ. So I've mentioned above the white skin color and non-Muslim background of all, most of those who helped me because their examples alone debunk the bigotry and cynicism that extremists on, uh, uh, from these free wings. Which is fucking amazing, right? He's a victim of this crazy hate attack and the first thing he's trying to do is to defuse the situation. He's saying, guys, let's relax. I got attacked. Someone busted up my head. I've got an open wound that's going to require stitches. I'm going to have a scar on my forehead for the rest of my life. This guy obviously did it as a racist attack. He shouted, I think, something um, uh, packy at him, right? Like crazy fucking thing. But the one thing he's trying to do, Majid, is dim, is dim the hysteria. He's being like, hey, guys, let's relax. This guy was an anomaly. He was a fucking nutcase. It's not something that I, I, I encounter in my everyday life. And then you contrast that with Justin Smollett, he gets attacked. And the one thing that he's trying to drum home is the fact that these people that attacked him were MAGA-wearing um, um, homophobes. 
he's not trying to dumb it down. He's not trying to say, look, even though these guys said these crazy things to me, I know this is not reflective of the entire the, the entire country because I'm I'm proof of it. I'm a successful black character, and I and I kind of navigate, you know, a, across the U.S. without any trouble for the most part. He didn't do that. He he immediately tried to stoke the fires. And that's the bit that kind of really leaves a sour taste in my mouth. He tried to stoke the fires. He didn't try to dumb it down. And again, this is fucking super honourable for Magic because I'm sure he's like <coughs> feeling like shit. But instead of kind of and again, instead of kind of stoking the fires, he's trying to dumb it down. He's trying to um. Give people not to be too crazy. Just, again, what an amazing, what an amazing reaction. Um, it carries on. Uh, people from all ethnicities and all faiths and 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 none that uh, from all faiths and none helped me yesterday. It is in that spirit that I wish to carry on my work. I do not wish to harbor hate for my attacker. I've already been down the path at a younger age, and I've seen how that leads to nothing good. Finally, I thank all of you for asking after for asking for me. I'm sorry I cannot reply to each of you personally. It is time to rest. And there's a picture here, finally, of him, like, actually look busted up. Now, contrast this face. Again, I'm not saying what you had to believe, but let's contrast this face with how Drissy looked after he supposedly got his ribs cracked or he supposedly was rushed by two people. This is somebody being punched by one person. Imagine two people, right, who look like those Nigerian actors that they look like, right? Imagine two two built black dudes beating you up because you're a homo because you're homo homosexual and you know they're MAGA supporting supposedly and then you've got just a little cut underneath your eye come on oh, again man it's just i don't know man i don't know i hope this whole stuff stops man no more victimhoods let's all try and let's all actually try and you know like change the narrative that's existed nowadays on social and can actually try to get along let's try that instead of actually you know stoking the fires of bigotry it's not going to get us anywhere not going to get us anywhere anyway Continue here. Du, 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 du. Mm, 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 mm. I think you know what? That might be a good place to end it because there's loads of fashion stuff I want to talk about, but I'll leave that for tomorrow because we're only on one hour. We're in an hour now, isn't it? One hour of Action Zinger Show episode number 160. Again, thanks so much for tuning in. It's been a great to have you guys. And I'll see you guys again tomorrow. For those of you on the podcast, click below to read, to subscribe to podcasts on iTunes and Spotify. If you're watching on YouTube, give me a like, give me a share, a little subscribe and all that malarkey. And I'll see you guys again tomorrow for another episode of the Excellent Zinger Show. Peace!